coming for you. Can't nothing stop me. I got some things I gotta do. Hey, 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 hey. I'm making a move. Robbie Thayer, thanks so much for being with me here today on Hired the Podcast. Incredibly excited to have you, my friend. Um, we've known each other for a couple months now, talked, talked a whole bunch, and I'm excited to uh, hear your ideas on really the dramatically changing uh, landscape of the world of work. But uh, it, let's let everybody know a little bit about who Robbie Thayer actually is, down to his core. Oh. Down to the core, I don't think we have enough time today on the <laughs> on the podcast, but I appreciate you having me on, Travis. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting topic that we're going to talk about, but before we dive into that, um, I've been in staffing and recruiting for just shy of a decade. Um, started out as a recruiter back in 2012, uh, which seems like forever ago, um, and I started with Apex and kind of worked my way up and moved into sales and I've been with some large organizations, been with some small companies and been to been through some mer- mergers and acquisitions, which seems to be happening quite a lot in this day and age. But um, recently and roughly, I think it was 2018, 2019, I made the switch to um, software sales. So selling a product back to staffing and recruiting companies at that helps them manage their, you know, their ATS and CRM in that aspect. So continued to be very ingrained in, in the staffing and recruiting world. And, um, you know, it's something that I love. And I think uh, the knowledge and, and the connections that I've gained over, over my time is, is valuable and still ears to the ground on this ever-changing world that, that we live in in staffing. So that's yeah. who I am in a, in a nutshell. That, and that's being t- the... Uh... The first U.S.-based employee for Venturi, <laughs> one of the fastest-growing ATSs out there right now. Um, you you probably talk to uh, more staffing and recruiting people than just about anybody else, and you probably got a strong pulse on what a lot of staffing and recruiting people are hearing out there in the industry. Because we're, frankly, we're all living in a bubble. I mean, yeah. we, I've got I've got friends, and I've got. Um, compatriots at other recruiting firms that I talk to on a regular basis, but it's a pretty small subset. We've got our own, our own echo chamber and, you know, just telling the same things that we're hearing. But for you to talk to such a diverse group of people in the world of work, in the world of recruiting and staffing, you've got to be hearing a lot of interesting things going on out there right now. Yeah, I think, I mean, just given the nature that, um, uh, what Vin Cherry's doing and, and, how we've grown, you know, my goal is really, you know, I'm the foot soldier here on the, on, on the U S soil, but, um, it is such a diversified group because we could talk to agencies that really only focus on, you know, high volume staffing, or we could talk to executive search firms and and retain search firms and they're, they're seeing something different. Uh, so I think depending on what the staffing firms focus is, and what they're trying to accomplish, they're going to be experiencing um, this market in a very different landscape. Um, and that also, I think, reflects on on the industry that you're supporting as well, too, right? So, you know, healthcare saw a massive, healthcare staffing saw a massive uptick, right, over the past 18 to 24 months for, for some odd reason, right? Some and, odd reason. <laughs> uh, but you'll you turn around and you look at, you know, warehouses or um, high volume staffing where the, where they're frontline employees, you're going to see a very different, different landscape. Um, and I think, you know, that's just a reflection of, of the times. But I, I feel like a lot of the companies that I've talked to in that industry, they're, they're seeing it start to come back and um, there's some more stability in the market. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the scenarios are, are very um so drastically from from who we talk to it's it's kind of it's kind of tough to wrap your head around exactly you know where we are and, and what's going on depending on who we're talking to every day what do you see that um different agencies out there are doing that are bringing the most value to to their customers to the companies they're working with out there in this current environment um, well, I think 
you know, th that's that's a pretty interesting question. And again, though, I think those answers really will vary on on their focus, right? So, if you're looking at an executive search firm or, or a direct hire firm, your the value that they bring is um, the ability to have candidates screened and vetted in a fashion that is favorable um, to to the hiring manager, right? And I think you could probably make that general statement across all industries, um, but for the most part, the organizations that are adapting and educating their hiring managers on the environment that we're hiring in now is very different than what we were hiring in in 2018 and in 2019. So the ability to bring that value and to have those real conversations and then for your organizations or your clients to listen to that is really what's going to continue to help you guys um, be successful. Um, so I, you know, that that's kind of how I would round that question out. And if there's something else you want to elaborate on that, then maybe you're 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 seeing in your bubble that would be different. You know, I'm happy. Well, I heard to... I, uh, I heard a really interesting statistic the other day, and I don't have it at my fingertips, and I apologize, so I can't cite it, and you know, I'm fudging the numbers a little bit, but, uh, in, in 20, in 2008, for every job open, there were nine people, nine people looking for work for every job open in yeah. 2018, for every job open, there were six people looking for every job open. Now for every job open, there is 0.9 people wow. looking for a job. There is less than one person for every job open on there on the market. Not to yeah. mention all the jobs that are going to be coming open or should be open or people should be replaced. You just can't find anyone. So what, in this market where there are so many jobs and so few people looking for work, what can, what can companies do to differentiate themselves from their competitors out there in the market to find the 0.9 people that are looking for work and that are hopefully at least semi-qualified. I mean, that's the, the, the semi-qualified is, is an interesting statement that you make because um, I feel like some organizations are in a position where they are unwilling to change uh -huh. and they're going to have to take what they can get, right? Because, um, you know, the top qualified candidates are going to have three to six opportunities at their fingertips that may be better than their current situation. So when it comes to a staffing firm, finding and maintaining those candidates, it's all about how easy you make it for the candidate. How are you able to build relationships with those candidates? And then how are you able to manage those engagements once they're on site so that you can redeploy them and or help them with their they think of you um for their next opportunity right mm -hmm. um and there's i mean there's a handful of tools that you can use um, but i think when it comes down to it no matter how much technology gets thrown into our our industry it, it comes down to a people business right so <clears throat> uh, contractors are going to think of the person that affected them uh in the most sought after way, right? That That's a long lasting kind of relationship. So, but you have to maintain that, right? It's not something that mm -hmm. you can do one time and then move on. And I think that stat that you said, I'm wondering if that's like across the board or if that's an industry specific, because when you talk about um, where we are going as a society and the fact that technology is basically the forefront of that, I would I would love to know what that shortage is for IT jobs. Huh. Um, there was an article that SIA put out that there's going to be a global talent shortage. I had this stat down because I, I knew that it's important. Um, that could reach a scale of 4.3 million workers by 2030. So at that point, you have to be in a position where you can think outside of the box, uh -huh. whether staffing firms take on um, classes 
or like teach people how to code or, you know, building those additional values that organizations need, right? I mean, colleges and universities can't pump out 4.3 million IT and STEM candidates by 2030. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no way. So those creative ideas that, that you come up with are, are going to be the things that separate you apart. Yeah, well, I, I have a theory that this current market that we're in could be incredibly beneficial long term to the workers out there because we've been preaching it for for a long time that companies should hire what they can train you know back when there were nine people six people looking for work for every job that was open yeah companies had the ability to focus on finding the perfect qualifications skill sets and previous experiences to match exactly what the job they were looking for was going to do and i think that might have hurt companies because they spent so much time searching for the perfect skill set that they weren't mm-hmm. searching for the best person the best person to add to their work community and it, i think it took a toll on companies cultures on their coworkers on the ability to collaborate to share, to learn, to grow together because everybody was just doing the job that they were qualified for. Now, with so few people out there, companies really have to work on building an employment brand, treating their people right, paying their people well, and focusing on the people who have... Let's just talk to everybody who has the minimum qualifications to be adequate at the job. Yeah. And I don't say that disparagingly. Yeah. Minimum qualifications to be adequate and then focus on the people who have all of the soft skills, the right uh, temperament, the right mentality, the right vision for their career to match with the company. Skill set be damned. I mean, how much of most jobs, uh, doctors, programmers, engineers aside, how much of most jobs can you really train in three to six months? A lot, and yeah, I mean, I think anything under the under the requirement of five years, you can train those people as long as they they show a good work ethic, um, some sincerity, and the ability to get the job done. I think, you know, anyone can, as long as they're given a shot, right? If they have that mentality, and that I think that can kind of change the way that you want to interview people as well too, right? Because yeah. you said, I mean, you are absolutely right. 20 between 2015 and 2018, those those hiring managers that we're dealing with, it's five rounds of interviews, four different people, a tech screen, personality assessment, you know, and you're managing for a, a six month contract engagement or a 12 month you're you're managing like it's a direct hire and i think one thing the pandemic did is is shock the system right it no longer can you do six rounds of interviews with with candidates no longer can you spread the interview process out over two to three weeks because if you want to continue to hire top talent, you're going to have to know what you're looking for, be ready to go and be ready to pull the trigger. I've talked to a couple of my past colleagues that are like, we're seeing managers hire in one to two interviews max. And mm-hmm. if they go any further than that, that guy's off the market for sure. Or that gal's off the market. So, um, you know, that's, one way to to speed up the process i think the other way is there are organizations out there too that are building these um you know these boot camps for people or they're using a third-party boot camp person where they can go in and they can learn uh, we're talking about technology but they could go learn a, a, a you know how to code in six weeks or they could you know go through the technology camp that that the organization is offering and that helps organizations retain those entry-level kids 
um, mm. and those entry level candidates. And I think that's the other thing too that we, some of those organizations were so focused on like they have to be X amount of years out of school, and weren't necessarily looking at the people that maybe want to change career paths altogether, mm -hmm. right? No longer yeah. does that frontline um, warehouse worker want to go do that. He or she wants to learn how to code in Java, right? Like, I think those those types of opportunities, I think, will present themselves very well over the next couple of years because there is going to be a big shift uh, in the workforce and, and what we need uh, to continue to move forward from a technology standpoint. So, yeah, for sure. And another thing that a lot, a lot of good companies have started to understand is that the interview process is not a one way street. I mean, every, everybody yeah. that applies to one job is applying to multiple job. Everybody that's interviewing for one job is interviewing with multiple companies and a lot of candidates, they have the power and companies need to be willing to be interviewed by the candidates in order to help them understand if their company is the best place for them, for their career, yeah. for their family. And before it's mindset left over from the industrial revolution, a worker was a cog in the machine. They were easily replaceable and they should be goddamn grateful for the opportunity to work for our company. Yeah. That ain't the, that ain't not the case anymore. No, it's, it's almost, it's almost flipped. Companies should be grateful for the workers willing to join their workforce, to join their company community and to do great work for them. Yeah, so, yeah I, I agree. How, what are companies think... doing to, to shift that, to, to change that mindset, to help draw in the best and brightest out there? Well, I, you know, it, the resounding feedback that I've gotten is organizations have to be willing to adapt to what is now the new way of working, right? You can't try to throw a wrench in the system and, and drive everyone back into the office because mm -hmm. they've got a taste of 18 months of 24 months of a new family work-life balance that you're still seeing productivity equal, if not greater. Um, and they don't have to sit in, they don't want to sit in traffic for two hours. You know, I live in Atlanta. There's no way an IT developer that lives north of the city wants to drive an hour and 30 minutes to get to work by 830. That means they got to get up at five if they have kids. Mm -hmm. You know, now they can get up at 730, seven o'clock, have time with their family and still get the work done that they need to do. So... I think the biggest thing, I mean, you can say, oh, throw more money at them, right? But what I'm hearing is candidates are willing to take less for more balanced work approach. And so if, you're, if organizations and your hiring managers aren't open to that concept and they're complaining about losing candidates, there's a conversation that needs to be had with those managers. Um, or just turn the business down. You know, I got mm -hmm. a buddy that I talked to. He's like, I can't tell you how much business we're actually turning down because organizations are unwilling to change. Mm -hmm. It's like, we got more business than we can handle right now. We're not going to jump over hoops if you can't get with the current climate, you know? So that's, I mean, that's another option. That's a tough, that's a tough option, right? Is are your clients actually worthwhile clients now? So well, how many companies are really asking themselves why about that question? Why do we want our workers back in the office full time, five days a week, 40 hours a week to, to what purpose? And I know yeah. there are, there are jobs out there that you have, have to, be. to be, you have yeah. to be on site, but if they don't have to be, what's the why? And me personally, I'm excited to go back to the office. Some of the time, these four yeah. walls continue to get smaller. I, I would love to be in, be in the singular place with, with my colleagues, collaborating, working together, it, just having those off the cuff conversations as opposed to every time we're 
we're meeting, it's, it's a structured Zoom call with an agenda. Yeah. That being said, I do not miss being in the office five days a week, <laughs> 45 hours a week. So there's, but that's just me personally. And our company has taken the time to ask our why. We're giving people the option. We're working on building a new, uh, building out a new office uh, to open later this year where people have the option. If they want to work and collaborate together, they can. If they can continue to be productive from home and they want to, they can. But how many companies are out there asking that why? To what purpose? Why do we want people back in the office? Yeah, I think if your answer is because that's the way it, it was and that's what we want to go back to, it's probably not the best answer. I think the why, <clears throat> I, think you're, I think you're right. Adding that human element back into the workplace and the camaraderie and really, I mean, your office um, component is really your company culture, right? So mm -hmm. like 100% remote all the time. What two things, what kind of company culture are you portraying out in the market and what kind of loyalty are you building with your with your employees because you know in the market too like if i had a 100 percent remote job and no need to go in and some recruiter calls me and says or calls an individual hey i got another opportunity that's also 100 percent remote it's going to pay you x amount more what loyalty does that individual have to the organization because generally it's the people that that keep individuals at the organization longer or opportunity, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's obviously something too, but, you know, I think <clears throat> we're going to hit a crossroads here too. I, um, I can't remember who it was, but a, some of the larger organizations just said, we're just not going to go back to, to the office. We're just going to stay hundred percent remote. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder in 18 months if, if they'll change, change their tune. But I do think having the flexibility to, if you want to come into the office, great. If you don't, that's okay too. Um, but you know, we'd love to have you around your colleagues and things like that. You know, and if you just want to sit in your basement or your office at home and code, or you know, fill out TPS reports, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> then that that's okay. I think a hard and fast rule isn't going to serve your organization well, and it's not going to serve your employees well because they'll. And we already saw it, like the the great resignation, right? You and I talked about this the other day. How many yeah, people? Well, I'm, I'm so curious about this because it's it's all in the news, and maybe it uh, it's a catchy title, but <laughs> uh, so the, there's this great resignation coming. Well, there's so many open positions right now, so many companies looking. What would happen if? Everybody resigned. I'm just trying to puzzle out the math of it in my head. Like, where is this great resignation coming from? There's so many open jobs. Well, are these people going to resign from their job to take the exact same job, similar work, similar pay? Where's this, where's it coming from? And do you think it's going to happen or are we already in the middle of it? I think we're probably in the middle of it, if not maybe at the end of it. I, I mean, what was this? What was the stat we talked about? Thir on average, there's a thirty percent turnover. You, that's how many yep. people resign from yeah. their job, right? So, yeah, person stays in a job an average of three and a half years at this point. Yeah. So, if, so that means that every year, a third of the workforce, on average, is changing jobs. It's out for jobs, right? So <clears throat> you look at maybe combining with organizations that furloughed 10 to 15% of their workforce that probably weren't going to leave. Maybe they were, let's say half of them were going to leave or they mm -hmm. were the underperformers that were eventually going to get let go. Mm -hmm. So now you're at anywhere between 35 and 40% of the yep. people looking. Yep. And then you have your, you know, so no one really changed jobs in 2020, you know, everyone, was, uh, especially that first, you know, between March yeah. and July, everyone was happy to have a job 
you made it through the furlough season, kind of buckled down, organizations were laxed on, hey, we're getting through this together. Um, you know, let's all you know, buckle down and do what we need to do. And we'll come out of this sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So <clears throat> here we are 18 months later. Yeah. Later. So there's right? another 10 to 20 percent that otherwise would have quit. But having a secure position yeah. with so much uncertainty was so important. So you add add all that up 30 plus the 10 plus the yeah. 20. Then we're at. You're at 60 percent. 65 yep. percent so, which feels i mean the like math the makes resignation yeah the math makes sense and then you know now it's well everything slowed down too right so companies either did more with less and realized that and now they have a bunch of cash to spend and they need it and they're behind on projects so they need to mm -hmm. ramp up um, or they're in a situation where it's the opposite. It's like now we're demanding more because we found out that we could get as much work done. And so those employees that were maybe used to doing a lot more are now looking at the job market saying, well, I can go somewhere else and make a little bit more and not have to deal with Mm -hmm. someone making me work 50, 60 hours a week remote. Like, I don't know if that's, if that's more of a case than really just the natural way of the 30% turn, just compounding over 18 months. And that's where we're at. Yeah. And then the fact that organizations couldn't keep up because everything came to a stop there for a couple of months. Right. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, I think that's kind of, kind of where it is. I mean, we definitely need a chance to try and catch up. I wonder, yeah. you know, I asked some of the colleagues I spoke to, like, how long do you think this goes on for? The answer is very, you know, like, no one really knows, but everyone wants to capitalize while they can. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I think the best way to capitalize now is for companies to understand that if there's somebody great that comes your way, regardless of whether or not you have an opening, if you can bring them on and you're a good place for them, you should bring them on because they're not going to be available in two weeks, two mm -hmm. months, two years. It's, you just have to have an eye for, for great talent in the marketplace. And if you're a place where that talent can thrive, you got to take advantage of it and hopefully they'll take advantage of it too. Yeah. Uh I think that's, um, I think that's a great point. I also going back thinking about my recruiting days is when you have that good candidate come across your desk, don't shelve for the perfect opportunity mm -hmm. when they were like, Oh, I'm looking for this perfect job. Mm -hmm. Well, I got six companies that would love to hire you. Do you want to look at it? Like, don't be afraid to send it to, to your hiring manager and say, Hey, listen, this guy's ready to go. He, he or she is fantastic. Great work ethic fits what you're trying to accomplish, you know, checks all the boxes. I mean, if there's a technical aptitude that maybe doesn't add up, I think organizations should be more willing to, to take a shot at that. And if they don't, then there's another organization that will, right? I mean, it's a candidate market at this point. Yeah. So companies have to sell themselves. Yeah. Which is and very can different. Can you train it? Yeah. Can you so train I it? Wanna, uh, Go ahead. I, uh, I wanted to circle back to something you touched on earlier, and that was um, the building and cultivating of relationships with the candidates. And mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of an interesting mind flip for me because for so long I've advocated to candidates that the best way to get a job is to always be building and growing relationships with companies you might work for one day so that if if you're engaging with thought leaders in your industries with great companies in your industries at all times then when you do need to look for a job you're a known commodity 
They know mm -hmm. who you are. They know your ideas. They know what you're about. And it's so much easier to reach out to somebody and say, hey, Robbie, we've been, we've been buds here and on LinkedIn for, for a couple of years now. I love what you're doing and, and, and I think you appreciate where I'm coming from. I saw your company's looking for a position I think I'd be a good fit for. Can we chat a little bit about it? As opposed to applying for a job and ending up in ATS hell. Yeah. But now it's almost flipped where companies need to be building relationships and engaging with everybody who might be a good fit for their company ever so that when they are looking, they can reach out to you and say, Hey, Robbie, look, I know you've been, in, you've been engaging with me and our company for a long time. Love your voice out there in the market. I've seen the work that you've done. It's great. I think you might potentially be a great fit uh, or your career might be a great fit with a role that we've got coming up. You open to hear a little bit about it. I'd love to pick your brain and see what you think if this could be something good for you and for your career. Yeah. It's such a dramatic shift. How, how do companies go about doing that, build and engage, and building and engaging the talent brand long before that person could be a good fit for the company? Um, well, I think in the company can't do it, right? Like the individuals at the organization have to be willing to branch out and network and realize, hey, there's there's something here. Uh -huh. Maybe not now. Maybe, you know, like like you said, I think it goes back to the networking piece. You, you know, when you start out in your career, and I can attest to this recently, when you start out in your career, you're just chomping at the bit. You're knocking down every single door. You're trying to connect with every single person and get an opportunity. And when you get that opportunity, you you got to take advantage of it. And I think if you continue to show that repetitive or show that um, skill set and that mm -hmm. work ethic that companies are looking for, <clears throat> especially in staffing, every staffing agency um, ends up knowing who their top producers are. And you'll network with them and you'll connect with them. And at some point, you'll have the managing director of a competitor reach out to you and say, hey, how do you like it over there, right? Like that mm -hmm. kind of stuff goes. And I think from a staffing perspective, like how you, <clears throat> from, and you're right, from a candidate perspective, how you maintain your relationship with your, you know, your recruiter, because your recruiter can be a voice for you as well too. Mm -hmm. right? Hey, this guy, this gal is doing ABC. And it's important to stay in contact with them uh, for a number of reasons. One, you want to retain that business at one point. And two, you want to be able to advocate for them so where their their job transition is, is really simple. And you have companies fighting for that individual. So yeah. hopefully that yeah, answers your question. I felt like... A little bit. A little maybe bit. You maybe know, I went off, but off a little bit there, but... No, you made a really good point. Like, it, like a brand can't do it. You know, Coke yeah. can't go out there and start engaging with all of the prospective uh, food scientists and salespeople and marketing yeah. people. But if the vice president of research and development for Coca-Cola is out there taking time deliberately every day to connect and nurture relationships with all of the brand new food scientists in the market, all of the technical development people and they're nurturing and engaging that network and they're constantly doing it without any thought of actually recruiting that person. Their goal yeah. is not to recruit that person, just to become known to them and to bring value to, to them and their careers. Well, five, 10 years from now, your network is going to be so large of people with, engaged with you that when you do need someone, it's such a different message to yeah. you for not a knock on talent acquisition teams, but for somebody from a talent acquisition team to cold reach out to somebody and say, we've got a job. We think you, your background looks like it'd be a good fit versus VP of R and D reaching out and saying, Hey, Jenny, I've watched your career 
since you graduated. I, it looks like you've done some amazing work. I'd love to talk about the work that you've done because we've got this position coming up. And yeah. I wanted to see if we could be a good fit for you and your career because I'm, I'm almost positive you'd be a good fit for us. It's such a different message and so much more effective and you're so much better able to identify the people who could really thrive in your organization. But again, so few people are doing it. How many hiring authorities are literally taking the time to invest in building, growing, and nurturing their network? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for them, but I don't think that's a common thought process or maybe it's becoming a common thought process. I'd love if anyone's listening after to follow up and say, Hey, I've done this. I'd love to hear like what that success has been. I think, <clears throat> uh, you know, along those same lines, if you as an individual don't continue to maintain relationships of peers and managers and things like that, you, that you had at organizations because people are going to eventually go their separate ways. I mean, you said it earlier, average 10 years, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So how you conduct and carry yourself at that organization, you may have a past colleague or boss that you've built a relationship with that knows you and knows your brand, reach out and say, Hey, this is what this company's doing. And they're selling you on the organization that goes a long way too. But I mean, if you had, you know, a, you know, COO reach out to all the salespeople in a specific market, I that would go way farther than a recruiter because mm -hmm. you'd be like, why does this guy want to connect with me? He's running a billion dollar, like, you know, that you, I think you would be flattered at some point and then you'd definitely be more inclined to take that person's call or LinkedIn request or in mail response than, you know, recruiter messages saying, oh, there's a great, great role for you that we have that doesn't even fit any of your skill sets because it's just an automated outreach. So like, mm -hmm. you know, there's got to be a personal level to it. And I think that, again, we mentioned that already, you know, recruiting at the end of the day is all a personal, it's a personal building of, of your network. So, mm -hmm. you know, you are your own brand as a recruiter and how, how you conduct yourself and how you manage that network is going to determine how successful you are at the end of the day. So, uh -huh. well, one of the big struggles for all talent acquisition people out there is, is managing the managers, you know, oh, yeah. managing the hiring authorities through the hiring process. So what can, what can people that are tasked with the responsibility of, of talent acquisition do to encourage these, these hiring leaders to do everything they can to be a part of the talent acquisition team? Because it's, it's, it's it's one of the top three, if not most important job in the entire company is to hire the best people for your company. And it's the responsibility of everybody yeah. on some level. So what can, what can talent acquisition teams do to get more buying, get more involved in from, from everybody? Well, I think that, <clears throat> you no, know, if you're talking about HR talent acquisition teams, you know, they have a responsibility to understand what's going on in the market as well, too, and educate those managers. Now, if you have to go through Talent Act um, as a, as a you know, third-party recruiting company, helping them understand what's happening and really build a relationship with that, that end person that's making the decision and educating them just on what's happening, whether you have the ability to report on the data or just simply provide them with what you're seeing and educating on that, educating them on how to adjust to these new times and, you know, creative ways that you said, Hey, maybe take some time once a week to, for an hour to reach out to people you're not connected with that you need to fill a space for may not be now, may not be in a couple of years, but I think, I mean, that's a good um, strategy, but like, Managing the managers is one of the toughest things for staffing, sales, recruiters, whatever, because everyone, the managers have a certain expectation. Mm -hmm. And if we can't manage those expectations, you know, you could do everything right 
and still not meet their expectations because we didn't go through the right procedures to to make them understand how this is going to go and what they need to do to be successful. And, you know, recruiting companies are at the front line of it. You guys know what's going on. You, you know, you need to turn around and be a consultant for your, for your clients and say, hey, listen, you're not doing this. This is causing you to lose out on Y. We need to do Z to, to correct it. Um, and if you can't have those conversations or you're scared to have those conversations, um, it's, you're just going to be going in a circle. So Well, everybody involved from frontline recruiters, talent acquisition, hiring authorities, executive leaderships, and even the candidates, we're all, we're all partners in this. We're all mm -hmm. working to find the best people that have the most potential to help companies achieve their visions. And if we all work together as partners, then it's the likelihood of it happening is so much higher than if we're all adversaries trying to fill a job wreck. Yeah, uh, I would agree. If there's, again, we've said this a couple of times, but if there's no flexibility on any of those, I mean, the candidate doesn't have to be flexible, right? Because the candidate at this day and age, they can pick and choose, but the recruiting company, frontline, the hiring managers, there's no flexibility at the end of the day. You're going to be getting what you can get, and that's really not in the best interest of, of their organization, right? So. Not in the best interest of anybody. No. Uh, Robbie, thanks so much. Uh, tell us, what are you... What's coming up from Vincere in the next couple of months that we should be excited about? Yeah, no, that thanks for uh, for asking. So recently, um, we were acquired um, by the Access Group, which is an organization based out of the UK. Which honestly, it's pretty exciting because now there's just um, a lot more resources that can be thrown to the product. Nothing's changing; it's still the same team, still the same uh, Vincere that well. The United States don't know and love yet, but soon they will. Um, <laughs> that people around the globe have become accustomed to. Um, I think we're on track for some really interesting product releases. Um, it's awesome too because this organization. Um, a lot of companies say that they do this, but we take our clients' feedback very seriously. And if there's there's a case for it, we implement it into the roadmap. We release all of our skill sets or all of our release notes, why we did it. Um, so that's kind of, that's uh, one thing. And then I think we're going to be looking at doing some sort of uh, our own podcast, US based. So we'll be reaching out to the thought leaders in the industry um, as well, too. We'd love to, when we get that up and running, have you come back. It probably won't be uh, me. You're hosting making because, me you blush. Know. <laughs> um, but yeah, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty exciting time. You know, we have U.S. employee number two. We have some support people working U.S. hours, so it's it's starting to get moving. And uh, I think you'll see some pretty pretty big things from us here in 2022, especially in the U.S. So, well, we'll keep our eyes peeled. Robbie Thayer, thank you so much for being with me here today. Really appreciate it, sir. Good luck. Good luck. And let's. Uh... Let's create some partnerships. Let's get some great people hired. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Travis. I really appreciate All it. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to Hired the Podcast. I'm making a move.